Good morning, Kingdom Life. By now, if you're in the sanctuary, you know that myself and Lady Kay are not there worshiping with you. But I'm very excited to bring to you this morning a young man who has been coming to church here for almost about two years. Travis is a young man who came during the pandemic one particular Sunday and has continued to come since then. Currently, Tra Travis is the chapter director of University Christian Outreach, or UCO as it is also known, at Michigan State University. Presently, he leads a team of 12 other individuals known as missionaries who are being discipled and mentored by him, but also led by him to actually spread the gospel on Michigan State's campus. Back in 2019, he graduated, but feeling a call to ministry, sensing that UCO was a good place for him not only to have engaged in, but now to actually be a leader within, he decided to stick around, and not only did he stick around, but he is doing ministry there on campus. Throughout his time at Kingdom Life Church, also his time at Michigan State, prior to his graduation, and even after his graduation, uh, Kingdom Life has partnered with Travis and his ministry there on campus to not only be an encouragement support through prayer, but also a support at times through financial giving. This morning, I've asked him in my absence to actually share some of his story with regards to what he does at UCO, his connection with Kingdom Life Church, and the blessing that that has been, but also to open up God's word and to share a sermon with you all. So as you are preparing your hearts and your minds, getting ready to receive God's word, while you won't be receiving it from me, you will be receiving it from Travis. Uh, before I forget, I want you to know that Travis is not alone. He is also joined by his lovely wife, Missy, who they've been married now, uh, I think, a little under a year. So we're very excited to not only have him, but also have her as a part of our church. So this morning, we ask that you would put your hands together and be an encouragement as you not only support, but also pray for our brother Travis as he brings God's word to you on today. God bless you, and I look forward to seeing you again. Well, my wife and I look forward to seeing you all again very soon. Bible, just raise it, raise it high and proud of you. You got a phone and you read, use that as a Bible, you can, you can raise that as well. Uh, and it goes like this. This is my Bible. I believe it is the infallible, incorruptible, and uncompromising word of God. I believe I can do what it tells me I can do. I believe that when I do what it tells me to do, then I will have what it says I will have. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. How's everybody doing today? Good. Good. Like Pastor Boris said, my name is Travis, Travis Wiesenberg. Um, originally from just outside Detroit in a town called Redford. Um, went to Michigan State, graduated, was thinking I was going to go into the business field. Go, and the, go white. Oh, that's my man. Uh, and then the Lord really, he really uh, transformed my life and called me to do UCO. And I've been doing that, that work on Michigan State's campus for the past three and a half years. And uh, this year, my lovely wife, Missy, you can raise your hand. This is right there. Uh, yeah, so we've been married for six months. She joined me. She did it before, but now she came back to do it at Michigan State. And so Pastor wanted me to share a little bit of, of what we do on Michigan State's campus. And the main thing we do is uh, we go onto campus and we, we kind of have a simple, a simple plan. It's reach, call, form, send. First, we want to we wanna reach students on Michigan State's campus. We want to build genuine relationships with them. We, we believe God, Jesus, he was a relational God. He still is a relational God. And so we build relationships with people. And the next thing we want to do is we want to call them. We don't want to just hang out, have a good time. We want to actually call them to, to come to know the Lord and to respond to him with their whole lives. And then third thing, reach, call, form, form. We want to, we want to form them in, in maturity. You know, a lot of these students, they're 18 to 22 years old. They're figuring out their life. They're figuring out what they want to believe in, how they want to live. So we want to help them uh, not only respond to the Lord uh, in the beginning, but also form the kind of habits and the lifestyle to live for him for the rest of their life. And the last, this is this may be the most exciting part, is, is send, reach, call, form, send. We want to send a group of next generation leaders and missionaries, pastors, fathers, husbands, teachers, mothers, out into the world to continue to build the kingdom. That, so that's our vision. That's what we're doing at Michigan State. Uh, we've seen God work in, in brilliant ways, amazing ways, the past couple of years that I've been there. And I'll, I'll just tell one story. I'll tell one story of a guy, uh, a friend I met. Um, his name's Justin. And he grew up, he didn't, he didn't believe in God. He didn't believe that there was a God. He, was, he would consider himself atheist. And um, 
me and another missionary were kind of reaching out, out to him. He, his brother was in UCO, and we were, we were starting to build a relationship with him and a friendship and start to talk to him about the Lord a little bit. But he was still, he was still considering himself an, uh, an atheist. And then we invited him to this retreat. We kind of built the trust up, the friendship, uh, that he came to a retreat where, where the gospel would be preached and we'd pray for uh, people to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And so he comes on this retreat and goes to the first night and, you know, he looked a little, kind of looked a little uncomfortable. He's, he doesn't believe any of this. All these people here are, are praising God around him. Um, and I meant to kind of, to get a conversation with him, but the day got, a, got away from me. And then right before Saturday night, we have a big, big prayer meeting, a time where, where the gospels preach and people can choose to respond to the Lord. And it was one of those prayer meetings, maybe you guys have been, been to something, our worship service, where it was just the Holy Spirit was palpable. The Lord was just moving, and people were excited to worship, people were engaged fully. And I remember seeing him right before, right before the worship service, and he looked uncomfortable. He looked, he looked a little scared, or looked, uh, looked nervous. So I went up and I was just like, hey, hey, can I, can I pray with you? And, and he was like, sure, you know, that's, that's fine, you can pray with me. So I just said a quick prayer, I just said, Lord, would you have Justin be open to whatever you have for him tonight? Amen. Simple, simple prayer. So the, the beginning of the worship time, we worship, and then we actually split into, into small groups to, to have people uh, pray to receive the Lord and pray for the Holy Spirit to come. And so all the guys, we, we left the main room and kind of had to walk like a, a quarter mile up to uh, this other kind of chapel area. And so me and like 50 other uh, college students and some of the other workers we, we all walked, and it's, and it's just silent, which if you know college students, that's already a miracle. You know, no, no, no sound, no nothing. Everybody was just in tune with what was going on. But we get to the room, and I look at one small group, and they look kind of panicked, panicked. And I was like, oh, you know, what's up? And, and they said, Justin, he's missing. And I'm like, oh, man, he's missing. You know, he's, he's, he, probably like, he probably saw all that was happening and probably got freaked out and, and left. And so I was like, all right, don't worry about it. You guys get started, and I'll, I'll go find him. I'll go back to the room and see if he's there. So I bump into uh, another missionary who'd been reaching out to him, and we, we go into the room, and, and he's, he's just he's sitting there. He's coming out of the bathroom, putting his jacket on. And, and I just asked him, I was like, hey, like, hey, man, how are you doing? And he just says, I'm good. I'm, I'm really good. And it was one of those moments where I, you can, I could just see that he had encountered the Lord. And, and after he said that, he just came up and he was like, he's like, thank you, and just gave me a hug. And then the other missionary said, thank you, and gave, me, gave him a hug. And he walked back up to, to go pray and, and give his life to the Lord and re receive the Holy Spirit. And what had happened, praise the Lord, praise the Lord, what had happened is he left that prayer with me, and he goes into this time of worship. As everybody else is starting to worship, he prays a very simple prayer. He says, God, I, I've... I've been trying to find you, and I'm, I'm frustrated because I haven't found you. And he said, the Lord said, I'm frustrated too because I've been here the whole time. And, and he said it was, it, was, it was like a movie. Just came on in his mind of every moment that he thought was a chance, every moment he thought was an accident, was the Lord's sovereignty in his life leading him to this moment. Praise God. And... I got the chance, yeah, hallelujah. I got the chance to live with him, uh, to help walk, walk with him in discipleship, and now he's actually a missionary with UCO at University of Pittsburgh. And so, praise God. And I share that story to encourage you guys, because I'm, I'm not, I didn't go to school for this. You know, I'm not, I, I didn't, like, come from, like, the, the, you know, most holy background in the world. I, I was actively not living for the Lord for most of my life. But when I said yes to the Lord, he used me. And I just encourage you guys. I feel like there might be some people here that you think the Lord can't really use you to do crazy things. If you surrender your life to the Lord, if you give your life to the Lord, he will use you in ways you could never imagine. I promise you that. And I, I want to thank, uh, before I jump into kind of the word, I, I want to just give a thank you to Kingdom Life and, and you, all people who are a part of it, because Kingdom Life has been one of the biggest supports of what we do at Michigan State's campus. Uh, Pastor Boyer, you know, he talks, he talks a lot about keep being kingdom-minded. There's a lot of people who talk a lot about being kingdom-minded, but he really lives it out. You know, every time I've ever come to him with a need or anything, he's quick to, to send money, send prayer. I had a missionary who came one time, one time to a service, 
and ask for Kingdom Life to, to support him to be uh, a missionary on Michigan State's campus. And Pastor Bart was like, absolutely, not a question. And this year, he, he's, uh, we have our big kind of uh, fundraising breakfast in a couple of weeks, February 21st. And he said, yeah, I'm going to lead a table, and I'm going to bring uh, any, anybody from Kingdom Life that wants to go. So if you're interested in hearing more about the ministry, uh, please come. But, yeah, that's our pastor. That's our pastor. He's a kingdom-minded man. And, and whether you guys know it or not, you sowing into Kingdom Life has actually, some of that fruit has come and be, been born at Michigan State. So thank you. I thank you. Because you don't see the changed lives. Like, you don't see the Justins. You don't see uh, the Lexes. You don't see uh, the, the, you know, 40 other names. You don't see my little sister. My little sister has been transformed by, by the Lord working through UCO. But I do. But it was through your yes and the Lord using that in some miraculous way that fruit is being born on Michigan State's campus. So thank you. And today, I just have a simple message. I really do. I, I, I won't take too much time, hopefully. Um, but I have a simple message. It's a message of good news. That's really what I want to do. I just want to give a simple message of, of good news. We all could use some good news, right? I remember, um, yeah, about a year ago, I got some great news. You know, the kind, of, the kind of good news that no matter what's going on in the day, it changes, uh, it changes everything. My good news was that Missy, she said yes to marry me. Amen. Praise God. Amen. And, man... I had a plan, you know, I had a plan going. I thought I was going to do something really cool to propose. Uh, I was like, we, we had our first day in, in Detroit, and so I had this all planned out. We're going to go to the art museum, uh, then get a little, uh, hit this nice little joint to get something to eat, and then walked on the riverfront, and then I called up this church that was significant to us. It was where we first said, I love you. Um, and it was by the airport, Ball Road Tabernacle Church. And I said, hey, could you have someone open the door so I could propose there? And they're like, yeah, for sure. Um, We'll send our man Dewey there, uh, and, and Dewey will be there, and he'll unlock the door, and he'll be hiding in the back, and he's a photographer, so if you need pictures, and I was like, oh my God, praise God, you know, this is going great, but the day, the day did not start great, you know, I, I uh, first off, I was wearing some contacts that, for, they were a little dry, so my eye had this weird little twitch to it, so it was like, bad start, um, and then, man, we, I, was, yeah, I, was, I was nervous, so we were like breathing through everything, art museum, you know. I don't even like art like that. I don't even know how we went there, but um, we breezed through it. And, and then I forgot that our first day was in the summer. So we walked the river trail for, you know, a couple hours just talking, getting to know each other. But this was dead February. It was like 10 degrees. So, and I know I can't be at the church till 7. So we, we straight up sat in the Renaissance Center for like three hours. And, it, and I don't even like cars like that. And Missy definitely doesn't like cars like that. But, but eventually we get to the church. And I'm like, all right, we got to the church, and, and I'm, I'm like, oh, let's check the door, see if it's unlocked, kind of play, play it cool. I open it up, go in there. Missy's like, what are you doing? This is breaking and entering. This is not cool. Um, but I see in there that, that there's just an older woman who just, who just is sitting in one of the pews. And I was like, oh, no. Some, some woman from the church, some, like, really faithful woman probably saw all the churches unlocked. It's lights are on. I'm going to go in there and pray. And I got to get her up out of here, you know. <laughs> she can't be here. Uh, so I go up to her, and I'm like, hey, my name's Travis. Like, I talked to, talk to Dewey, and she's like, oh, I'm Dewey's wife. He's in the back. I'm like, he's in the back? What are you doing here? Like, you, like, you got to get, she was like, oh, like, are you ready for the pictures? And now Missy's coming up, like, wondering, like, hey, what's going on here? And I was like, no, like, it hasn't happened yet. Like, please, please go in the back. And Missy still didn't hear it, but then she walks away. As she's walking out the back, she was like, yeah, I'm sorry we didn't light any of these candles, but when you're done, we'll come out and take some pictures. I'm like, oh, man. Uh, but I'll tell you what, I'll tell you what. When I, when I got down on one knee and I asked her to be my wife and she said yes, that was, that was good news. That's what I thought. I was like, that is the good news. No matter what else happened, that is the good news that changed my life. And today, I got, I got better news. I mean, that's second best news in my life, but the first best news in my life is the gospel. And so that's what I'm going to share about today. And whether you've, uh, you've come across the gospel uh, never before, if you've heard it your whole life in church, I think the Lord wants to speak to you something this morning. He has something for you personally, each and every one of you. And I want to speak about this good news through the lens of one man coming across it himself. So if you have a Bible, we're going to be in Luke 19, uh, 1 to 10. 
he entered Jericho, this is Jesus, he entered Jericho and was passing through. And behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was rich. And he was seeking to see who Jesus was, but on account of the crowd he could not, because he was small in stature. So Jesus, he's passing through Jericho. There's a crowd kind of mobbing around him, per usual, and we're introduced to this guy named Zacchaeus. And this, and this passage tells us three things about Zacchaeus. Uh, first, it says he was a tax collector. Many of you might know this already, but the tax collectors were hated, were hated by the Jewish people. They were hated by the Jewish people because the Romans, they came and they occupied the Jewish people and they oppressed them. And, and they started extracting all these unjust taxes. And we Americans, we hate unjust taxes. We know this, we had a whole revolution. Um, so they started oppressing them and getting taxes, but they didn't use Roman people. They didn't just say, oh, we're gonna, the Romans are gonna take taxes from the Jews. They said, we're gonna, we're gonna make Jews take taxes from the Jews. So the own people would tax their own people. And I, this isn't a perfect example, but like the only way I could kind of like somewhat uh, make it relatable is, it'd be like if some, some foreign country came in and conquered us. Let's just pick something unreasonable like Canada. You know, like let's say Canada, came down with all their horses and whatever else they got up there, and they conquered us, and they started to oppress us so we would never rise up again. And they, but they didn't want to just take all the money at once. They would just say, we're going to tax everything. We're going to give them a parking tax. We're going to give them uh, a road tax. We're going to give them a food tax. You know, whatever they do, uh, a TV tax, anything, Wi-Fi tax, everything's taxed. Um, but they realized we don't got the manpower to extract this tax. So what we need to do is we need to employ Americans to tax other Americans. And you're thinking to yourself, what kind of spineless, you know, traitors would tax their own people and help the, help the oppressors continue to reign over us? But then sooner or later, you see these dudes out there in their spiffy little shirts and their nice little clipboards, and you're like, oh no. And one time you, you park your car and you get out and, they, and you hear someone say, hey, that's $5 for the parking tax. And, you know, you, you just keep it moving. You, don't, you only slow down to say in the, like, most nice Christian way where they can put that parking tax. But other than that, you just keep it moving. But then they say your name. They say, hey, Travis, if you don't pay that parking tax, you know, I'm going to have to report you to the authorities and you might be arrested. And you whip around and you look at who just said that and you're like, man, that's my neighbor. Like, I watched the game with you. I mowed your lawn. Like, I went to Kingdom Life. You know, it's, you would be like, man, this person is an absolute traitor. And that's who Zacchaeus was. The other thing we know is it, it says he was rich. The only way you get rich from uh, tax collecting is you take some, some money off the top. So not only was he taking the unjust taxes, but he was also upcharging his own people so he could live comfortably. And the last thing, or the other thing it says, it says he was small of stature. He was seeking to see who Jesus was, but on account of the crowd he could not, because he was small in stature. And, and so, so that's our guy, a guy who is, who is hated by his own people, who gotten rich from uh, unjust gain and is shorter than the average guy. But we also know, we also know one more thing about him. And I think this is the most important thing to know. It says he was seeking to see who Jesus was. He was seeking to see who Jesus was. And maybe that's why some of you guys are here today. You know, maybe that's why you're here today. You, you met somebody uh, who had a joy or a kindness to them, and they said they go to Kingdom Life Church, and they invited you, and you thought, man, maybe I'll know something. I'll figure out who this Jesus person is. Or maybe you grew up in the church, but it never clicked, and now you're on some hard times, and you think, man, maybe I'll, I want to go and see who this Jesus guy is. And you may even be a little bit skeptical today. You may even be skeptical about this whole thing, but I, but I encourage you to do what Zacchaeus did. Seek to see who Jesus is. Seek to see who Jesus is. Genuinely open yourself up to Jesus Christ revealing himself to you personally. And some of you may think, I've already done that. I've been in church my whole life. Uh, but I didn't ask if you've been in church your whole life. I said, genuinely open yourself up to Jesus revealing himself to you. Because you can be in church every Sunday and never open yourself up to the real Jesus uh, revealing himself to you personally. And that's a tragedy. That's a tragedy. I think it doesn't ha it, this church makes it pretty hard. We, we preach a real Jesus. We preach a Jesus that you can encounter today, but it can still happen. We can deceive ourselves that well. And some of you may be thinking, uh, I'm not going to ask Jesus to reveal himself to me because I don't think he's still here. You know, I think Jesus was a good, he was a good moral teacher, 
He had some good things to say. He was kind of like a, a Plato or an Aristotle. He had, some, he had some good thoughts. But the whole death and resurrection thing and that he's alive today and that I can encounter him, I don't really buy that. So I'm not going to ask to encounter Jesus. And first I'd say, yeah, it, the death and resurrection thing, it is, it is a hard thing to wrap your mind around. It takes faith. But so does believing Jesus is just a good moral teacher. So does just believing that all Jesus was was a good moral teacher. I think in a certain way, that takes more faith. Because Jesus himself said he was God. He made it very clear. He said, I am the son of God. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am God himself. And so Jesus can't just be a good moral teacher. There's really only three options. The first option is that he... Uh, was actively trying to deceive people, that he knew he wasn't really God, that he knew he wasn't the son of God, but he tried to trick everybody. But my problem with that is the amount of prophecies Jesus fulfilled. Like there was, there was hundreds of prophecies that Jesus fulfilled, even prophecies about his, where he was born and how he died. And so even if, if Jesus was some clever con man or some clever con man tried to do this, he would wake up and, and realize 20 years later, I was born in the wrong place. This doesn't make any sense. Or, he would be, or his death would go all wrong. But Jesus fulfilled over 400 prophecies. So I don't think he was he's simply a, a deceiver. So if he's not a deceiver, the other option is, is he could be confused, right? Uh, is that Jesus thought he was the son of God, but he was wrong, which, which would make him crazy. You know, if someone came in here and said, I am the son of God, we would say he probably belongs in a mental hospital. Right? Uh, but my problem with this is read Jesus. Read, read the teachings of Jesus. Read how he moves through the Gospels. Read anything true about Jesus, and you realize this man is not crazy. And if you, you realize he is the most wise man in the room every time. And so if he's not a con man, and he's not crazy, the only other option is he's real. And he is who he says he is. He is the Son of God. He is the Son of God who, who died and was resurrected. He is the Son of God who comes back again. And if that's true, which it is, I believe firmly it is, that means that he is alive today and you can encounter him this morning. And, last, and lastly, some of you, you're, you're, in, the, you're in the third camp. You, you've already encountered the real Jesus. You've already experienced him. And today, my invitation for you to encounter him again, or Ryan's invitation as well during worship, for you to encounter him again can only be met with one thing. Yes, please. Because to, to know him is to want more of him. He is really that good. And so our story continues with, with our man Zacchaeus. He's boxed out by the crowd. Uh, he's in the back. And, and it says in verse 4, So he ran on ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him. For he, he being Jesus, was about to pass that way. And when Jesus came to that place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. So he hurried and came down and received him joyfully. And when they saw it, they all grumbled. He has gone in to be the guest of a man who is a sinner. And friends, this is the good news. This is, this is the greatest news. Zacchaeus, the tax collector. Zacchaeus the traitor, Zacchaeus the man who, was, who couldn't even get a glimpse of people, who had to go and, and just climb a tree to hopefully see Jesus far off in the distance. Zacchaeus, the one hated by his own people, that's who Jesus comes up to. And he says, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down. I need to stay at your place. And he calls him by name. He calls him by name. That means that Jesus knew who Zacchaeus was. He knew that he was a tax collector. He knew that he oppressed his own people. He knew that he was uh, this kind of spineless coward. And yet he still called him to be in relationship with Jesus. He still said, I want to come to your house tonight. He still said, Zacchaeus, I know all that you've done, and I want you. Do you see what that means for us? It means that no matter what you've done, no matter how far you've been from the Lord, it, it, it means that no matter how, how long you've walked away from the Lord, that the Lord knows your name and he wants to be in a relationship with you. That is great news. And today, at this very moment, at this very moment, he's saying your name, and he's saying, hurry and come down, for I want to, I want to stay at your house tonight. 
And some of you may think a relationship with God sounds great. You know, you, you like church, you like to kind of see other people's relationship with God. You know, you're kind of like Zacchaeus. You like to, to climb the tree and kind of see from a distance, think this is good. You know, this is, this is helping me. But if God knew what I did, if God knew how I treated my ex-girlfriend, if God knew what I was up to this summer, if God knew what my addiction led me to do, if God knew the dark thoughts in my head, he wouldn't want anything to do with me. But the truth is, he knows your name. He knows your name, he knows all that you've ever done, and he wants you. He wants to be in a relationship with you for all eternity. That's our God, that's who Jesus Christ is, and that is the greatest news you will ever hear. He, you will ever hear. The Son of God knows all that you've done, all that you will do, and wants to be in a relationship with you for all eternity. Praise the Lord. But you might be thinking, this sounds good, but this, this sounds like wishful thinking. You know, how, how could this be? You know, Jesus just forgives you no matter what you've done, uh, no matter what. And I think, again, we look to, we look to Zacchaeus. And, and where before, when he was a tax collector, we, we looked to him as, as an example of what not to do. I think as, as it goes on in this verse, we look at him as uh, what to do. It's, Jesus says, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down for I must stay at your house today. So he hurried and came down and received him joyfully. Received him joyfully. Zacchaeus received Jesus joyfully. That is our only right response, is to receive Jesus Christ joyfully. Because you can't earn salvation. You can't earn salvation. What we've already earned through sin, through choosing, sin is just choosing your own way over God's way. It's a distance through God. It's a death, a spiritual death. We've, that's what we've earned. We can't earn salvation, but you must receive it. You must receive it. And Jesus, or Zacchaeus receives Jesus joyfully. Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And I think we know that. You know, whether we want to be honest with ourselves or not, we know that deep down we've done some wrong. That when it comes down to us being before the Lord, we know that there are some things we've done wrong. We've, we've hurt people. We've, we've hurt people that we shouldn't have hurt. We've, we've cheated, we've lied, we've stole, uh, we've thought mean things. So we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But in verse 24, it says, and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption of Jesus Christ. Amen. And most of us, we just celebrated Christmas, right? We, we understand uh, gifts. You know, may, maybe some of you guys received a gift. And uh, that's a great thing. You know, I don't have to explain too much about uh, what gifts mean. I have to explain, to explain about tax collectors, but in America, we understand gifts. And so when your grandma or whoever gave you a gift, maybe she was a hand, hand-knit sweater, she didn't say, here's this hand-knit sweater, that's $50. Because you would probably say, grandma, that sweater ain't worth $20. Uh, no, you wouldn't say that to your grandma. But it wouldn't be a gift, right? If, you, if someone gives you a gift and you give them money, that's a transaction. But a gift... All you can do is just receive it or not. And you may have even seen someone, like, I've, all, I've never done this. I love gifts. If you give me a gift, I will receive it unless it's really bad. Um, but you ever see someone who tries to give someone a gift and they don't receive it? It's really awkward. You know, it's really uncomfortable. And so we have to receive the gift. If, if you don't receive it, there is a way to receive it. And if you don't receive it, you don't, you don't have it. And so the offer of Christ is a gift a gift of salvation, a gift of forgiveness of sins, a gift of having your past wiped clean by the blood of the Lord. That's an amazing thing. That means everything you've done wrong, everything you've done wrong is wiped clean. It's forgotten by the Lord. It says he removes our transgressions as far as the east is from the west. That's about as far as you can go, right? East and west, that's as far as you can go. A gift of the spirit, the spirit to, to actually, the power to live out the way you were supposed to live, to live a life of love, of joy, of peace, of kindness, of gentleness, of self-control. You know, at the end of your life, you're not, you're going to think about, Am I, was I success? What you're going to think about is not the money in your bank account, but it's, it's, did I love people? Was I peaceful? Was I joyful? A gift of a new family in Christ. That's amazing. That is so amazing. You know, you still have your biological family, and praise God for that, uh, but you also get a new family in Christ. I was just in the back talking to Dewan. And there was a shared, uh, shared spirit, a shared oneness of we both have encountered the Lord and are sons of the Most High King. And so whatever he needs, I'm here for him. Whenever I need, he's here for me. That's a beautiful thing. 
And most of all, the gift of spending eternity with God himself. That's the greatest thing. That's the greatest thing, is to be with God forever. You know, God doesn't give us the good gifts. He is the good gift. And so you can't merit it, because all we've merited is, is, is separation from God. But you can receive this gift of grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. And not everyone in the world has chosen to receive it. And unfortunately, not everyone will. You know, it, sometimes we think about Jesus' death and resurrection and his forgiveness is that he just did that 2,000 years ago, and then everybody else, we kind of get a free ticket to heaven, no matter what. But you have to receive it. So not everyone will, but today you can. And you receive Jesus in two ways, but it's really, it's really kind of just one way. But it's, it's called you repent and believe. And, and Zacchaeus, again, he does this well. He's a good example of this. In verse 7 it says, And when they saw it, they all grumbled. He has gone in to be the guest of a man who is a sinner. And Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor, and if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I restore it fourfold. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, since he also is the son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. So Zacchaeus, what does he do here? He leaves behind his old life of extortion, of unjust gain, of, of being rich for you know, his own comfort, and he looks to, to then live his whole life for the one who came to seek and save the lost. And repent, repent simply means to turn. It means to turn from, from the way you've been living, turn from your sin. And belief is, is, is to entrust, to entrust your life to Jesus as your Savior from sin and the Lord of your life. To make it even sim simpler, to receive Jesus is leave behind what you're currently living for and live fully for him. Say to him, I, I no longer want to follow my own way. You know, my own way hasn't got me that far anyways. But I want to follow you my whole life for the rest of my life. I ask for your forgiveness for my sins and the power to live the life that you want me to live. And the good news is, he's already said yes to you. He's already said yes to you. You don't have to worry, if I come to God, is he going to accept me? He's already, he's already said yes to you because he knew your name when he went to the cross. He knew your name when he went and died on the cross for our sins. Jesus was fully God, but he was also fully man, meaning that he could know all things at one time. And so he knew, and he was thinking about you. And you may be thinking, oh, maybe he's thinking about my neighbor, and maybe he's thinking about the person two rows ahead of me. No, he was thinking, he was thinking about them, but he was also thinking about you. And he did it because he loves you. He did it because he wants to spend eternity with you. And not only did he die, but he was resurrected. Praise God. He was resurrected, ascended to high, and he will come again and reign in glory. And in John 1, it says, he came, to, he came to his own, and his own did not receive him. But to those who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. And that means that we will be children. We will be co-heirs with God for all eternity in the life to come. And we already are experiencing that in part, but we will experience it in full for all eternity. But you have to receive him. So he has said yes to, to you, what will you say to him? Verse 7, and when they saw it, this was the crowd, they all grumbled. He has gone in to be the guest of a man who is a sinner. Everybody else doesn't get it. They just grumble. They don't get it, they just grumble. Thinking, why would they choose, why would he choose uh, a sinner to follow him? And some of us, you know, we may be thinking, what do I need to repent for? This all seems a little bit drastic, this whole, uh, you know, receiving God, this seems a little bit uh, intense. Well, what Jesus said is this, for the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. He didn't come to make bad people good. He didn't come to make good people better. He came, this is his mission statement, to seek and to save the lost. And so until you realize you're utterly lost without him, you'll never find him. You'll continue to grumble and miss the beauty of the gospel, the gospel of grace. But if today, if today the Holy Spirit is doing something in you, and, and, is saying, and you're saying, I need the Lord. I need the Lord desperately. I may have gone to church plenty, but I've never chosen to claim him personally as my Lord and Savior. Then the good news is, is there's still time, and there's time right now. Now is the perfect time as ever to receive Jesus Christ and to live for him. And guys, you come not in shame. You come not in shame. 
Remember how Jesus welcomed Zacchaeus. He said, Zacchaeus, hurry up and come down. I'm staying at your house tonight. And then later he says, salvation has come to this house. It's a party. It's a party. You come humbly, but you are exalted. God, God, humbles, God uh, exalts the humble, and uh, he, he humbles the proud. And so if you come humbly today, Jesus will exalt you as one of his own. He will exalt you as his son or his daughter. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. We thank you, O oh Lord, that you are a God of grace. We thank you that the invitation is there, that you've already said yes to us. Lord, I pray right now through your Holy Spirit that we would choose to, to give our lives to you, to follow you. Lord, I, I ask that you would give courage to those who need courage right now. Lord, I, I ask that they would not cry out uh, to, to some something of, of, of an old text, but they would cry out to you, Jesus Christ, who is here living and active right now. Lord, and they would receive you into their hearts. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. And so, uh, we always end the service like this, and, and it's, the, it's the, really the response uh, this whole message has been about. Uh, there's two, two responses. One, if you've, if you've never accepted the Lord, if you've never received Him, if you've never said, you may have been in church for a while, you may have heard other people uh, receive him, but you've never said, I want to receive Jesus Christ as my personal Lord and Savior. Uh, if that's you, just bow your head and pray with me. Lord, I thank you. I thank you that you came to seek and save the lost. Lord, I, I come to you. I, I don't even know fully who you are, but I, I trust that you are good and that you are God. And so, Lord, I ask for forgiveness for all that I've done for all that I know and all that I don't know. God, would you forgive me? And Lord, I believe in you. I trust in you that you are the savior of my soul. And Lord, I trust you as my Lord, that I don't wanna live for myself, I don't wanna uh, continue my own way of living, but God, I wanna live fully for you. So I give you my life, Lord, and I rejoice in knowing that you have accepted it. In Jesus' name, amen. Second group of people is, is maybe you've accepted the Lord before, but, but you've kind of wandered your own way. You know, you, you've started to kind of take back your life from the Lord and do things the way you want to do instead of how he wants to do. And so if that's you, I just invite you to, to pray, pray this simple prayer. Lord, I thank you that, that you have abundant mercy. You have mercy that is new every, each and every day. And God, I, I come back to you. I have strayed and I ask for your forgiveness. But Lord, I come back to you, and I believe that you are a merciful Father who accepts me. Lord, I, I don't want to continue to keep straying and straying, Lord, but I want to live in your house and live as your son or daughter for the rest of my life. And I thank you and I praise you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.